Hello and welcome to Encounters, New Perspectives on Asia, America and Europe. My name is Welf Werner. I am the director of the HCA, the Heidelberg Center for American Studies at Heidelberg University. With my colleague Barbara Mittler, founding director of CATS, the Center for Asian and Transcultural Studies, I would like to briefly introduce this new series of dialogues jointly initiated by our two institutes. The events in this series focus on the relationship between the two superpowers of the 21st century, the United States of America and the People's Republic of China. With a stunning rise of the People's Republic in recent decades, this relationship has become increasingly contentious. China's growing self-confidence is a challenge for the U.S. and its allies alike, and thus also embroils Europe in this new trans-Pacific geopolitical rivalry. While Europe's security continues to be guaranteed by the United States, its economic ties to China have grown considerably over the last decades. As a result, the European Union and its individual member states are looking for a safe haven somewhere in this simmering conflict. It is our conviction, therefore, that we need to know more about these two nations that will shape the world of the 21st century and that we need to deepen our understanding of their complex relationship. Our series of encounters offers a forum for discussion of multifaceted challenges in which a better understanding of Asian and American cultural heritage will play an important role. We hope that these dialogues will thus contribute to an informed debate on one of the most eminent challenges for Germany and Europe. How do we envisage doing this? Encounters brings prominent Chinese and American policymakers, as well as authors, artists, activists, public intellectuals, and representatives from the business community to Heidelberg University. Our guests will engage in a dialogue with scholars from the CATS and the HCA with us looking forward to a series of nuanced discussions on a wide range of controversial topics that are shaping the exceptional relationship between an established and an emerging superpower. We will zoom in on issues such as the environmental crisis and trade wars, questions of technology transfer and innovation, white-collar crime and digital surveillance, and last but not least, human rights and freedom of expression. In order to provide multiple perspectives on China-U.S. relations, we will consider different Chinese voices from the mainland as well as from Taiwan and Hong Kong. We will also offer contrasting American perspectives from politics to the economy and the arts. Thus, we will analyze newly emerging political and geostrategic constellations in a multipolar world with two strong rivals and discuss their consequences for Germany and Europe. How do the European Union and its member states position themselves in the competition between China and the United States? What are their current positions and strategies? What will the future bring to this new global landscape? Our encounters will seek answers to these questions, and we thank you already now for joining us in what we hope to be a series of inspiring exchanges. Encounters comes to you from the Library of Cats, where we're standing right now, and from the library of the HCA, where our discussions are waiting for us. It is my pleasure to introduce today's participants in this first dialogue of the series, Encounters. From the Heidelberg Center for American Studies, the HCA, we have with us Sebastian Harnisch, Professor for International Relations and Foreign Policy at the Institute for Political Science. Professor Harnish's main research interests include comparative foreign and security policy, international relations theories, cybersecurity, non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, and climate change policy issues, with a regional focus on U.S.-East Asian relations, and here especially North and South Korea and China. Some of his significant contributions in this special area are his work on role theory in international relations, and here specifically U.S.-Korean relations, as in, for example, conceptualizing in the minefield role theory and foreign policy learning in foreign policy analysis in 2012, 
um, or Embedding Korea's Unification Multilaterality in Pacific Review um, of 2002. He has also published Exploring the German Analogy, the 2 plus 4 process and its relevance for the Korean Peninsula um, in 2001. Professor Harnish holds degrees in history and political science from Trier University and spent time as a research fellow at the Japan Center for International Exchange in Tokyo, at Columbia University in New York, and at Yonsei University in Seoul. Before joining the Heidelberg faculty, he taught at Trier University and in Munich. He had also ample exposure in China, where he spent time as a visiting professor at Beijing Foreign Studies University and at China Foreign Affairs University. Our guest from afar is Cheng Li, Director of Research and Senior Fellow at the John L. Thornton China Center at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. He is a member of the Academic Advisory Group of the Congressional U.S.-China Working Group and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Before joining Brookings in 2006, Dr. Lee was the William R. Keenan Professor of Government at Hamilton College, where he had taught since 1991. Dr. Lee has been a recipient of fellowships and research grants from numerous different U foundations in the U.S., as well as the Hong Kong Institute of Humanities and Social Sciences and the Jiang Tingguo Foundation for International Scholarly Exchange from Taiwan. In 2002 and 3, he was a residential fellow of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington. Dr. Lee grew up in Shanghai during the Cultural Revolution. In 1985, he came to the United States where he received an MA in Asian Studies from the University of California at Berkeley and a PhD in Political Science from Princeton. From 1993 to 95, he worked in China as a fellow with the U.S.-based Institute of Current World Affairs, observing grassroots changes. Based on this experience, he has published an acclaimed book, Rediscovering China, Dynamics and Dilemmas of Reform, 1997. Ever since, Dr. Li has focused in his research on the transformation of political leadership in China, generational change, the Chinese middle class, and technological development. In these fields, he has published a strong a string of important books, both in English and in Chinese, among them China's Changing Political Landscape, Prospects for Democracy, and recently Middle Class Shanghai, Reshaping the U.S.-China Engagement. In a nutshell, this book does precisely what we are hoping to do in our series encounters. And all the more honored and happy we are to welcome Dr. Li as our first dialogue partner. He picks up on current fears of China's rise and advocates a better understanding of its history. The United States may be headed towards a disastrous conflict with China unless Washington updates its understanding of contemporary Chinese society, he writes. I'm sure that we will learn a lot from this conversation, and I now open the floor for Cheng Li in conversation with Sebastian Harnish. Enjoy. Barbara, and thanks to everyone for joining us, and especially to our guest in Washington, D.C., Dr. Cheng Li. A warm welcome from Heidelberg University. Thank, Thank you. you so much for being with us tonight. Um, in prep, Preparing for this talk, we have agreed to talk about three broader issues. First, the book, of course, and what I've called uh, the middle class hypothesis, and then about the areas of conflict between the two parties, and finally about transatlantic relations. Let's jump right in there. You make a point by distinguishing between um, cultural globalization and cultural transnationalism with regard to uh, the middle class, especially in Shanghai. Maybe you could explain a little bit what you mean by distinguishing these two terms. Well, uh, Sebastian, before answering your question, I have a few things to say. First, thanks, uh, Barbara and uh, Wealth for your generous introduction and your invitation. I'm honored and humbled to have a conversation with you, Sebastian, and also to answer questions from your distinguished audience. While I regret that I could not be so fortunate as to visit 
your truly prestigious university in person as originally planned, I would like to applaud the Herberg um, Center for American Studies and the Center for Asia and Transcultural Studies for your long-standing renowned efforts to promote interdisciplinary area studies and advance international understanding. Also, I would like to congratulate you on your recent, I mean, I mean really this is the first inaugural launch of this new lecture series, uh, Encounters, News Perspectives on Asia, America, and Europe. As for US-China relations, the European perspective and the stance are enormously important, given that Washington and Beijing have recently been caught up in a dangerously deadlocked bilateral relationship. In my view, the reconciliation of the two countries will likely be driven by a third party, such as EU and ASEAN countries. The title of your event today, Transforming US-China Conflicts, Common Interests and the Transnational Perspective, provide a critical message about the importance of EU and Germany in particular. Now, for your question, Sebastian. Yes. When people talk about the globalization, they usually refer to economic globalization. Many scholars, myself included, would be hesitant to reuse cultural globalization because this term is a conceptual paradox or contradiction. Globalization suggests a diffusion and the convergence of local and national norms or ideas, which culture implies distinctive features embodied in heritage and historical context. Cultures are necessarily diverse and inconsistent. The people of a given culture have experienced varied parts involving different memories, symbols, myths, styles, and the norms. It is neither feasible nor desirable to develop a global culture, the so-called global culture, because the very concept of culture imply that the people differ from each other. The idea of cultural transnationalism, uh, the other concept I use in my book, involves the formation of a certain shared norms, common knowledge, and the multiple identities through transnational exchanges, resulting in greater interconnectedness and a mutual understanding among different populations and traditions. Culture can never uh, converge, converge, but it must always be pluralistic in my view. Now this distinction, why is it important? It is important in the context of China's open open up and reform over the past four decades. Chinese people believe it is one thing for China to participate in Western-led globalization and quite another thing to conceive uh, of China's modernization as a process of Westernization. My new book, as Barbara uh, mentioned earlier, The Middle Class Shanghai, shows that the middle class in this most Western westernized city in the country welcomes the spread of Western ideas, middle-class lifestyles, and the cosmopolitan values. But it rejects notion of cultural dominance, hegemonity, and the uniformity, be it a communist or capitalist, conservative or liberal, as well as the dogmatic and the stagnant view of the so-called end of history. Now, the resurgence of cosmopolitan Shanghai uh, in the reform era supports the argument for the endurance of multiple identities and the cultural pluralism, Shanghai's local, national, and the cosmopolitan identities are all dynamic. They mutually reinforce each other while retaining independent value in different specific contexts. What is most evident from Shanghai's opening to the outside world is not cultural convergence, but a culture coexistence and the diversity. Back to you, Sebastian. 
Thank you so much, uh, Chang. Um, I think that fits quite well into our idea of encounters because it's a two-way street yes, of absolutely. encountering between two independent and yet entangled, so to speak, uh, entities. One of the theses that struck me in your book was that the middle class really has also an influence on elite politics in China. Uh, and also very much so under Xi Jinping. There is, I think, a prejudice here in Europe and maybe even in the United States that under Xi Jinping, we see a lot of centralization, personalization of the rule uh, in, in the fifth uh, generation of leadership of, of China. But you have a specific... Uh, idea how the middle class really has a bearing on those elite policies and uh, politics. And I understand that you call it um, the reprogress. Is that correct? <laughs> uh, can you explain what you mean by that? How does the, the middle class play a huge role in elite politics in China under Xi Jinping? Well, you are right that uh, Sebastian, that Xi Jinping's consolidation of his individual power, especially his abolishment of the presidential term limit, uh, in uh, you know March 2018, was achieved largely at the expense of the decades-long institutional development, uh, intra-party checks and balances. Is this is what the Chinese call regulations and a norm governing the so-called collective leadership in the party state. But one does not need to be an expert on Chinese leadership to know that the factional politics was, is, and will be, will remain important in Zhongnanhai. It is conceptually self-deceiving and factually wrong to believe that the CCP leadership has consisted of a monolithic group of politicians who share the same socioeconomic background, political experiences, educational professional credentials, a career path, policy uh, preferences, and ideological beliefs. So I don't buy that thesis. My book on middle class Shanghai uh, indeed has a chapter on the importance of political elites in Shanghai, entitled From Jiang to Xi, the enduring power and influence of the Shanghai Gang, this uh, the term Shanghai Bang. Now, Xi Jinping has a complicated relationship with the so-called Shanghai Gang, and also you mentioned the term pro regress. Uh, this is the term created by uh, American poetry in 1930s, but actually used in Shanghai exhibition uh, uh, by annual Shuang Nianzan about a few years ago. Actually, also has a Chinese term equivalent of self use called Yu Bu. You will like the Michael Jackson's dance. You look like a moon dance, look like the progress, but actually backward, uh, uh, but also sometimes backward, actually uh, forward. So to a certain extent, Xi Jinping also played around with that. Now, uh, Xi Jinping was largely promoted or endorsed by Jiang Zemin and the former Vice President Zhang, uh, Zheng Qinghong, who were both uh, co-founders of the Shanghai Gang. Xi Jinping also spent eight months as party chief of Shanghai before moving to Beijing to become the designated successor to Hu Jintao in 2007. Most interestingly, Xi Jinping is now surrounded by his confidants who also advanced their careers in Shanghai, including Power Bureau Standing Committee member Wang Funing, who has a nickname as China's Henry Kissinger, and Executive Vice Premier Han Zhen, uh, these are the two of the seven most powerful men in the Power Bureau Standing Committee, as we know. Also, that um, um, anti-corruption chief, uh, Yang Xiaodu, foreign policy chief, uh, Yang Jiezi, and Xi Jinping's chief of staff, Ding Xuexiang, they all advanced their career from Shanghai, who spent most of uh, the years uh, were born and raised in Shanghai. Ding Xuexiang, uh, the last person I just mentioned, will likely emerge as one of the most powerful leaders in the country, in the next five years and beyond. Now, it is also interesting to point out that recently, 
Xi Jinping made a political move to arrest two members of Shanghai Yan, Vice Minister of Public Security and also Vice Mayor of Shanghai. Both of them you know, have strong ties with the Shanghai Bank, particularly under Zhang Zemin and Zheng Jinghong. Now, all these trends show the dynamics and the complicities of the Chinese factional politics. At this uh, pivotal moment in China's rise, with the US-China relationship also entering toward a greater confrontation and the hostility, as both you and Barbara mentioned, uh, grasping the inter internal dynamics of the Chinese Communist leadership is uh, most critical, is uh, more critical than ever. Now, this also directly relates to an argument made in my book that the Shanghai leaders have some distinct characteristics in their policy orientation. Let me make it clear that the Shanghai leaders have never been identical. In PRC history, there has been some leftist or Maoist radicals such as the Gang of Four, all of them mm. advanced career from Shanghai or, or born in Shanghai and etc. Now, having said that, I do believe that the leaders of Shanghai origin or those who have spent much of their careers in Shanghai have some distinctive features again drawing from exp their experience running this most cosmopolitan city in the country. After the Tiananmen incident, Deng Xiaoping surprised everyone by designating a Shanghai leader, Jiang Zemin, to be his successor. In 1990, one year later, you know, Deng Xiaoping uh, made a statement. I quote here, uh, this is also quoted in my book. Uh, one of my biggest mistakes, Deng Xiaoping said, was I did not include Shanghai when I launched the, um, my, uh, the four special uh, economic zooms in 1980. The same year, China launched its historical plan for developing Pudong when, after Deng Xiaoping said the, the following quote. Now, during the Taiwan Strait crisis in 2000, in contrast to many hawkish Chinese leaders, Official in Shanghai reported lobbies against the military hardliners. Uh, then Mayor uh, Xu Kuangdi made a significant efforts to reassume Taiwanese. A lot of Taiwanese businessmen uh, work in the city then, even now, to certain extent. Now, similarly, President Jiang Zemin has been recognized by many analysts, both in China and abroad, for implementing a moderate approach to crises such as the Taiwan presidential election in 1996, Belgrade embassy bombing in 1999, and the EP3 airplane crash in 2001. You know, we are mm -hmm. all familiar with this uh, terrible crisis. Also, Premier uh, Zhu Rongji, former mayor of Shanghai, also strongly and skillfully, uh, later when he became premier, pushed for negotiations leading to China's success, uh, accession through WTO in 2001. Now these soft actions or reactions were criticized by many Chinese at the time, but they are now widely regarded by the public as wise policies. This is why important, uh, in, I believe uh, there's a, a, a significance of this uh, study of Shanghai elites, Shanghai leaders, and also complicated relationship between Xi Jinping with people from Shanghai. He actually really promoted a lot of them from Shanghai. Thank you so much. Let me challenge you by uh, raising an argument you make in your book yourself that the middle class right now is situated in the major metropolis areas, the first higher city, six of them, but soon enough, uh, they will move more to um, uh, other cities uh, within China uh, that are not as big, will the middle class that you describe uh, being situated in Shanghai, will it change its policy stances if it moves further into the country, lives uh, further to the West, whereas now the, the, the major focus of that group is in those big metropolis. Uh, in short, how coherent is that group and how long will those preferences be stable in time? Well, this has already happened. 
um, uh, the middle class moving from um, Shanghai and other major cities. You know, I remember that uh, Dominic Barron, now uh, he is the ambassador, Canadian ambassador to uh, China, mm -hmm. uh, almost 20 years ago, he was uh, the head of the McKinsey and he has team did that research. At that time in 2001, uh, about 64% uh, of middle class live in four cities, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Guangzhou. But now the, the number 67, you know, a job to like a 30 something or 40, you know, mm -hmm. this, is, mm -hmm. this is actually a few years ago. So you see also the coastal region previously dominated, now the majority live in uh, China's inland region. Now Xi Jinping recently uh, had a new term, common wealth actually really want to expand the middle class, mm -hmm. the same things with the, with the, the, the so-called Chinese dreams. Um, so that's a, a China's strategy. To a certain extent, it's actually similar to US that the Biden actually, the, for, the, his top mm -hmm. four agenda is really with, really with domestics, whether it be covert economy, uh, racial um, uh, 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 justice and the uh, climate change. And so that's, that's why he said that the foreign policy for middle class, he and the, mm -hmm. his advisor, Jack Sullivan, and the, uh, 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 the, the Secretary of State, uh, Tony Blinken, they all use that term before the election, after the election, and even now. Mm -hmm. And even Donald Trump, despite the, uh, he talked about make America great and et cetera. Actually, what he means is that the, the, the reduced tax for middle class. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so actually, uh, you know, uh, 2016, the reason he got elected because he got a lot of votes from the middle class. So mm -hmm. despite all the differences, we do see uh, there's some commonality. I think this uh, understanding is very, very important. Of course, there's some, a lot of tensions. Some politicians um, argue that the Chinese middle class eat lunch. I mean, um, now I may not agree with that the statement, but it is a fact that the China's ever expanding middle class achieved at the same time, American middle class is shrinking, has been shrinking from the 70% after World War II to now about 50% or even less. That created a lot of anxiety and the economic disparities and et cetera. There's also strong resentment against the super rich people. Mm -hmm. um, this is also in both countries. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I saw the news that uh, this, uh, when, uh, uh, Amazon CEO uh, Jeff Bezos um, had the moon uh, trip, you know, the space trip. Mm -hmm. There's 50,000 people wrote a petition asking him to not come back to the Earth. Yeah. So that's the thing to tell this kind of resentment that similar resentment also happened in China against Jack Ma and etc. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a challenge. You raise a very, very important question. Uh, at the moment, the Chinese middle class, it's about 40% or less of the Chinese population. So if they can expand to 60% in the next two or three decades, then China will be in much better shape. It's really, already China has the most uh, middle class number, but the China still is not uh, uh, in, a, in a definition like the middle class society, because you do need to go beyond you know, 55 or 60%, uh, uh, then you become a real middle class society. So that's a challenge. But on the other hand, Xi Jinping got a lot of support by his uh, um, uh, poverty elimination um, uh, uh, under his watch. He enhanced tremendously in terms of budget under his nine years. If you look at this, this chart like this, yeah. uh, that kind of development. Now, he was not a person who started that uh, uh, poverty elimination or um, uh, 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 reduction. You know, Deng Xiaoping, to a certain extent, Mao Zedong probably also did early on, but certainly not successful. But it's really happened during the uh, reform under Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin and Fu Jintao in these four decades, 800 million people got rid of poverty, uh, according to both uh, foreign analysts and Chinese government data. Mm. 800 million. This is 10 times the population of Germany, the largest, uh, most populous country in uh, Europe. So that certainly gave tremendous kind of credibility for Xi Jinping despite the problem early on I mentioned, term limit abolishment and the personality cut and et cetera. So that's the perspective, that's a challenge, uh, both progress and also 
uh, daunting challenges in the years uh, to come. Mm. So what went wrong to turn a little bit to the conflictual or competitive part? Uh, because we uh, we had in the 80s and 90s a period where there were reassurances on both sides. China would rise peacefully and the United States agreed that China should rise peace, peacefully and should be integrated into the world economy. But now the two uh, powers are at loggerheads. China talks, the Chinese officials talk about core interest and their protection and the United States uh, government, no matter whether it's Republican or dem Democratic, uh, talks about an omnidirectional threat uh, by China uh, in all areas technology, uh, as well as in the military, in the social sphere, and, and so forth. So what went wrong? And why did those two countries get in the situation they are in now? Well, uh, US-China relations have deteriorated in recent years at a speed and a scope beyond what could have been predicted. Mm. Uh, this most uh, consequential bilateral relationship in the, in the world is heading toward an adversary and a dangerous state. Not only has each side accused the other side of being a genocide regime and speculated that the COVID-19 pandemic was uh, originally from a lab leak in the other country, but the risk for military confrontation and the war between two superpowers uh, is also on the rise. <coughs> So this is what I call mutually reinforced fear and play an important role and also domestic politics, you know, uh, toxic nature of domestic politics in the United States and also geopolitical landscape change uh, in China's favor. And um, so these are all important factors uh, to contribute. Now, as we know that the uh, Trump administration in his final year you know, after March of 2020, when COVID was out of control in the US, um, the administration sought to defeat and destroy China in much the same way that the United States defeated the Soviet Union in the Cold War. That was evident in the four main fronts. Number one, on the economic front, uh, the, 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 the hawkish uh, uh, team wanted to have completely decoupling with China. Now, even that may hurt the US, uh, but they want to go for it. Number two is on the political ideological front, uh, the Trump administration uh, pursued the regime change to overthrow the CCP rule. That's not a secret. I mean, you look at the, the, the top leaders, uh, the yeah. Secretary of State, uh, FBI director, they said in different uh, occasions said we want to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party. That was a root cause of the problem. And number three, on the social front, they conceive the China's threat is the whole societal threat. This is really bother me. You know, you can say the whole state threat, but you can see the whole society threat. You become the culture domain, mm -hmm. and also want to ban uh, Chinese Communist Party member. I mean, there's 92 million Chinese Communist member, but also plus their family members. So 300 million people. How could you distinguish whether your Communist Party's family members or not? So basically, if you are from China, you are on the ban list. I mean, this is a, a really, uh, you know, I think it's against American values, against American interests. And finally, um, the on the military and the security front, and the Beijing fears that the U.S. will move towards supporting Taiwan's independence. Now, Biden administration actually different. They want to be selective decoupling, not a complete decoupling. Um, Biden said that, and his team said very clearly. We do not want to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party. And they wanted to still return to the cultural education exchanges. I mean, um, this summer they admitted that, you know, uh, uh, nine, almost 90,000 Chinese students. Right? Although I, I hope they will do more, for example, abolish the social, so called China um, uh, initiative, you know, really discriminated uh, Chinese scientists and students and et cetera. Now they haven't done that. but. Uh, I think they probably sh uh, should consider. And also, at least, uh, uh, you know, their statement where the senior officials of Biden, they say they're not to change that one policy, one China policy, 
right? Although in reality, there's a lot of movements um, actually uh, support Taiwan, make Chinese um, leadership very, very nervous. Now, but on the other hand, we face a real technology challenge you mentioned. This is a legitimate concern. You know, this is the first time since World War II, America uh, confronted an, a, a kind of rivalry or competitor, which is uh, almost uh, equally powerful uh, in terms of the technological um, side. You know, in some areas like AI, 5G, and then now the recent uh, the development of the uh, 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 supersonic missiles really undermine American you know, security advantage. So American superiority or advantage is a serious challenge. Now, this is not be easy, never be easy when you see this kind of geopolitical landscape change in, in such a short period of time. Particularly the US actually contributed to China's technological development early on. So it is understandable that some people raise legitimate concern but uh, whether that can work or not, I don't buy that. I think that uh, sometimes uh, you decouple is too late and also we're not effective and fundamentally will undermine American uh, interest. Now, but on the other hand, uh, Beijing decided to play a hardball. Uh, they believe that China now has more leverage in the current global economic lands um, landscape with it's a huge domestic market and it's relatively social political stability. Beijing also believes that it will take a long time for the US to recover from COVID-19, racial and political divides, economic structure problems, and a serious domestic economic disparity. You cannot say uh, this uh, uh, assessment is completely wrong. Now you can debate with that. Of course, no country is safe, but at the moment, this is a Chinese mindset. And also they believe that Biden is more under the time pressure than Beijing because of the US midterm election and the 2024 election. And um, so China, is, for China, it's no hurry. And also they think that uh, Taiwan, Xinjiang and Hong Kong are not are the issues, not negotiable at all. Now, only the climate change because China's own interests and, um, and also I think that the EU, probably, I mean, other countries really wanted to promote the, the collaboration in this area. But these are the things, it's, a, uh, it's a still Chinese concern that if there's a new administration after 2024, that all these things will be in jeopardy. Uh, 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 so, and finally, uh, there's some, some of the other issues, whether it be um, you know, the, the, the so-called chip alliance or semiconductor industry alliance, a restructuring of global industrial and supply chains, and uh, like-minded countries to boycott the uh, Chinese products or even Olympics and urging EU countries to reconsider the, the EU-China comprehensive agreement you know, on investment that you, you are very familiar with that. And also the invited Taiwan's representative to the inauguration and the change the name of Taiwan office and um, you know, considering, and also consolidated quad against the Chinese, uh, China militarily and uh, uh, forming you know, all across a uh, uh, trilateral security pact between Australia, the UK, and the US, and, um, and the same pact. Now, these are all considered as a serious threat uh, against China, and also in the few, day, few days, in a week, the Democracy Summit uh, at the White House. So, Chinese public believes that Biden administration is even worse than the Trump administration, although I do not know how Chinese top leadership think about that, probably different. But uh, I think uh, the, uh, the general uh, kind of view is that even worse because they form a, a very big coalition with EU, with some of the ASEAN countries, you know, and et cetera, give more pressure because uh, by, I mean, Trump only, his president Trump only do, uh, it did it alone, like right? America uh, first, America alone. So that uh, actually did not uh, give too much pressure. So these are the, the, the current uh, the challenge. Uh, for for China. So back to you. This is my assessment mm -hmm. about the, mm -hmm. how how both sides look at each other. Who to blame? I don't want a single person. I think <laughs> it's a, com a combination. But I'm more mm -hmm. leading towards a structure challenge, and uh, structure challenge is geopolitical landscape change um, in China's favor. But at the same time, if U.S. doing well domestically, political, economic, and foreign policy, and public health 
we will be less anxious uh, with the so-called Chinese model. But, uh, but now since we are doing, um, you know, uh, not uh, as we hope, so China's ever-growing power, the influence become uh, even more exaggerated and more threatening for us. This is another factor, and that particularly China's, you know, hardball play, and uh, 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 so so these are the factors, the combination. I don't want to, uh, want to say that it's uh, only U.S. fault. Uh, it's in action or reaction process, but ultimately, adjusting a new rising power is difficult. But we must to uh, 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 to be careful because I mean uh, there's a risk. You know, uh, we can discuss further to go back to uh, a new cold war or even hot war. Mm. Thank you so much. Encounters, I think, are about uh, being respectful to the other. And disrespect, hurt, misrecognition has been part of the uh, troublesome relationship between the two. Let me ask you, I think, with regard to certain areas, let's say the India-China territorial disputes, or the question of the international legal status of Hong Kong, or even when it comes to Taiwan, there is a perception, at least in Europe, that although the world has recognized uh, China's position on that, under Xi Jinping, the Chinese leadership has moved the goalposts, so to speak, on each and every of these issues. Uh, for example, militarization of the South China Sea, that it is very hard to accommodate a rising power that uh, calls for respect, but is moving its lines, it, its red lines on in various areas. So how to do that without getting into conflict with, uh, with Beijing? Well, uh, these are all very, very important questions. And um, certainly um, your interpretation differ from what Chinese perceive. Of course. They think it's completely different. They said that there's all these things is part of uh, America-led conspiracy to put China down, right? So with that kind of thing, this is what I call the mutually reinforced fear. We fear because uh, uh, China become military so uh, capable now uh, that, uh, uh, that the threat uh, become real. But China believes that you touch, you touch the red line because Taiwan issue is China's national sovereignty uh, you know, territory integrity and the political legitimacy, no leader could survive mm -hmm. if let uh, Taiwan become independent, right? So that's a, a, a mutual reinforced fear. Now, I don't think any party um, wanted to um, have a war over Taiwan. So like Biden said, uh, it's really the, the worry should be on the incidents one lead to another, then we caught up with such a kind of situation. Because this, uh, if that happened, um, the escalation will be so quickly. So this is uh, precisely that uh, Dr. Kissinger in the 97 or 98 years old uh, are studying uh, artificial intelligence and write articles or even book, could also book on that subject. Because this is a war never fought before. This is a war, there will be no winner. So therefore you should not fight at all. And the US and China, um, you use the term two superpowers, so, but they are equally powerful. That differ from the Cold War. Cold War, I think US has a superiority and the Cold War also, um, Soviet Union was not in the economic global uh, net system, but China is. And also at that time, ideological um, rivalry is so, uh, vicious that one side wants to completely defeat the other. I personally do not see China now has the ideology want to defeat the United States, completely destroy the United States. Similarly, I think a small, except some small part, uh, number of uh, hawkish people, most people do not foresee that we can completely destroy mm. China 
uh, and make Chinese Western a uh, westernized country. That is because we actually lost that hope, then become more anxious, right? So, and also some of my colleagues at Brookings said actually domestic, you know, kind of ideological conflict between left and the right probably mm. more vicious than international ideological conflict. I mean, this could be also said to China. Also, China is not a monolithic uh, uh, entity. I would say even within leadership has the different views, right? So all these things tend to be exaggerated. But I think the most important things, uh, we, first of all, we should make sure that all the net connections are still open. So that's the importance of the meeting, the recent the virtual summit between Biden and Xi Jinping. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, these two leaders met 11 times together, they traveled together to Chengdu and to Los Angeles. And uh, they also had numerous phone calls and um, uh, including the time when they were both vice president and particularly handled Bo Xilai case. Remember mm -hmm. uh, 2012, both of them are yeah. vice pre uh, presidents is before the succession in China. And uh, they had a very long conversation, you can imagine. And, uh, and uh, Biden um, talked about, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of, uh, you know me, and we do not need to be so formality. Xi Jinping called Biden good friend. But even mm. Trump, actually, I just uh, uh, reviewed some of the Trump's remarks a few years ago. This is not a long time ago, three years ago. Mm. Talk about Xi Jinping is a beautiful, it's a wonderful friend. I trust mm. him and we start a beautiful friendship. I mean, come on, but the, just like the, I mean, unbelievable at the moment, consider of the destroying China, the, all the evil things. But three years ago, it's a different picture, mm. right? But that's uh, related with COVID, related with the domestic politics, related with the, the again, as uh, repeated again, again, the, this is a period of uncertainty, anxiety, and also rapid change. So I think the most important thing is we should have empathy. We should not demonize each other. And uh, so emphasize on shared aspiration of a middle class and, um, and find a way to make sure we can share the market, share the, um, each other's success, but that we are not in the mood at the moment. But that was precisely the case. China's middle class started to emerge. They benefited American or Western countries' prosperity. Mm -hmm. There's no kind of... Uh, kind of principle saying there's only one country can have middle class or mm -hmm. well, only certain number of people can have middle class. While we actually witnessing the middle class expansion, not only just China, but also in India, in Indonesia, in many other countries. So I think that's a, that could be an opportunity for current advanced countries such as Germany. You can see, you look at German-China economic relations. It's a booming. I mean, it's the largest partner, right? I mean, there's no limits. Talk about the cultural influence, visit Shanghai. You know that the German center in Shanghai play a very, very important role, mm. right? And uh, so I think that uh, we do need to have mindset change. Uh, uh, that's very, very important. Unfortunately, that the COVID prevented the communication. We can only do that at the Zoom, but I'm very thrilled to hear that your program will invite the Chinese scholars and the American scholars to play that important role. I do believe, I think you probably share, uh, with the current this kind of deadlock in US-China relation, a third party, such as EU, Germany, or countries like uh, in Asia can be very, very powerful. Now, Biden in the United Nations, he made a speech about that we're not going back to the Cold War. I think this is the result of influence of other countries, including your chancellor, told him that we are not ready to go back to the Cold War. We do not see China. We are critical about China's human rights violation. We're critical about Xinjiang and, uh, and mm. the many other issue areas and the China's aggressive pressure on Taiwan. But we do not see uh, China's imminent uh, threat and that we should go back to the Cold War. Not only your chancellor, but the French president mm -hmm. and also British prime minister also had the same language. Mm -hmm. Certainly leaders like South Korea and Japan also uh, do not want to go to that for various reasons. So I think these kind of things, we we'll put that perspective, I think we reduce the danger. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a stake is very high, but the international community should work together and so your program certainly very much in line with that kind of idea. 
I, I do believe that uh, there's a lack of communication or animosities and the suspicion between two superpowers eventually will unfold if some other countries can play a positive, constructive role to prevent a new Cold War or devastating hot war. So in a few days, we're going to have a new government here in Germany. And if you had a wish for them, what would you wish for what the German government should do in order to improve the uh, conflictual relationship between the two? What does the United States government um, expect the Germans to do in this uh, situation? Is there anything specific on your mind? Well, I think that um, <laughs> your new government will face uh, a, a kind of interesting situation. Both United States and China wanted to make sure that uh, uh, Germany is not leading towards one. <laughs> they, uh, you know, but uh, your government they will play around in uh, whether it be equal distance or will be leaning towards one. But uh, based on my understanding, in terms of values, in terms of, uh, um, you know, uh, even alliance that uh, you certainly have much closer to US, but at the same time, China's market economic well-being and also a lot of uh, in, uh, global commons like climate change, nuclear non-proliferation, refugees, and uh, um, uh, um, uh, many other say, issue areas, uh, you want to engage with China more. But most importantly, Germany does not have the hegemonic you know, complex and uh, will not feel that they are threatened by a rising power and et cetera. But I think this is important leverage. Uh, uh, so I hope uh, 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 that um, sometimes um, we do need to use our leverage to push for progress in China. But at the same time, uh, should be also careful uh, not to caught up in a situation that like two blocks. Uh, that scenario actually is real, although I think it does not make sense at all. You will have because of the supply chains and the, uh, and the divide, you, you have tendency to have the two economic and trade system. You know, I wanted to get your opinion and the two internet and the cyber and the IT system. It's already happened like a Huawei, it's, I mean, it's a different model, different system. And the two, maybe um, navigation system, maybe three, maybe two, right? Mm -hmm. And then two, um, you know, economic and financial system, the uh, uh, currency system, maybe three, who knows? And also most importantly, it's uh, two ideological military blocks. Is that the world we wanted to return? So I, um, I really think that uh, um, some of the world leaders, I mean, state, statesmen like uh, Singapore prime minister, he said that we should not assume that we can end, uh, if it is a new Cold War, we can end up with the defeat of another superpower. It's impossible. So what means is we will experience some devastating result in the, in the time of the AI, if that, uh, that war occurs. So I think uh, nothing is more important than prevent these kind of things happening. But it's uh, difficult, it's not easy at the moment. I think it's, it's a long-term uh, challenge. And, uh, but on the other hand, I mean, um, early on mentioned that, um, you know, uh, uh, President Trump had so, uh, so many you know, words about the Xi Jinping, but all of a sudden, so, so things change, but it could change differently. You know, of course, the, the Chinese actually is also critical about the, uh, 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 some of the domestic problems. But um, if you already think China is the enemy, we want to do everything to contain China, you will really push Chinese middle class, Chinese society uh, to react the same things. If you look at these kind of four policies by Trump administration in the final year towards Beijing, you can see Beijing was uh, uh, strongly react so this kind of action reaction vicious cycle is precisely the things we should avoid. So in that regard, I do believe that Germany and along with many other countries will play that important role. That's a leverage you have. Uh, that's also fortune for today's world. 
Thanks so much. Let me let me answer that implied question a bit before I I open the floor for questions uh, from our audience. I think one of the major differences in the situation right now is although Germany is not equidistant between the two, we are always closer to the United States, uh, whom we owe so much uh, in our past and present. Uh, however, Germany, as well as other European and Southeast Asian, Central Asian countries, they don't want to choose between the two. Whereas during the Cold War, many countries were prepared to choose between the two superpowers. So that's a very important difference when it comes to whether those two uh, superpowers can enlist allies and then come up with two blocks standing head to head to each other. I, I cannot imagine that right now. And I don't want to imagine that right now for the foreseeable future. But let's turn over to the audience. And I think Barbara has selected a few questions she may want to raise right now. Yeah, I don't know if you can see me or hear me. Uh, yes, Barbara we can hear you well. OK, but perfect, uh, Sebastian. And thank you so much for this very insightful presentation. Uh, one or the other question uh, from the chat in a minute. Uh, but I would like to uh, use my power here in order to squeeze in a question uh, on, on the US side of the equation. Uh, uh, Chang, you said at some point that uh, American and Chinese middle classes could or even should uh, cheer each other's success. And as a scholar of the US, I would say, is it not uh, that the American middle class uh, has struggled uh, tremendously in the last decades and has uh, strong suspicions, uh, justified or not, that a crucial part of their problems is competition from China, of unfair trade with China and so on. So what in, in your view is so to say the American part of the equation if the American middle class is so unsatisfied with its position now for decades? Thank you. Well, uh, I think it is an excellent question. It's not easy. I think that uh, you do see that uh, um, the widely spread view that uh, um, Chinese are eating uh, lunch of, uh, you know, uh, uh, of our middle class, China's development at the expense. But not everyone uh, believe that. Uh, some of the political leaders like the Senator uh, 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 Saunders, uh, he certainly uh, think that uh, this, uh, you should not blame everything to China. We have the, our own economic structure problems mm. and um, economic disparity is also uh, may uh, necessarily nothing to do with China. Uh, it's our own economic uh, uh, structure problem or distributional problem. So we should not blame everything to China. But on the other hand, um, I think that uh, Chinese should be even more sensitive. So my book actually have two audience. One is for American audience that to think about that uh, you should not uh, push Chinese middle class uh, to alienate them. Uh, to, uh, to fail to make a distinction between state and society. Uh, this is probably the most dynamic force and the, the, their political view is still not uh, 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 determined yet. But uh, the other uh, audience is the Chinese audience. I think this is an emphasis on empathy and uh, certainly I'm critical of some of the aggressive, uh, you know, so-called uh, state capitalism approach, and uh, also um, the tendency are not sensitive uh, uh, towards intellectual property rights, American, uh, particularly the Main Street American uh, society, not the Wall Street, because the, uh, the, the well-being of American middle class, working class, uh, is very, very important. So again, share the wills to actually Chinese leaders because of uh, they start to realize that they talk about to make the uh, cake bigger, but it really should make the cake bigger to provide opportunity uh, for 
uh, American consumption and the American investment uh, to really have the win-win rather than just the only one side or, or China win twice. Uh, some other people made a joke about, about that. So I think that's a, a very important uh, structure change. Uh, uh, so at, at, it's not easy. At the moment, US leaders did not talk about uh, that, uh, the middle class cooperation. Chinese leaders also hesitant to talk. I uh, belong to a very small number of people along with some of my colleagues in Singapore talk about uh, uh, this, this could be a benefit from each other's success. This is actually the idea that Harry Clinton used in her presidential campaign, you know, just a few years ago. But now the rhetoric, the narrative completely changed. But if we change, we can change it back. Uh, if we go into the terrible situation, things not improve, but they're getting worse or even more dangerous. So I think that the public opinion will change. And uh, surveys, uh, sometimes we need to be careful. Uh, when you have the uh, breaking news, then you did the survey. Of course, you can expect what kind of result you have. I think the politicians, the leaders should be ahead of time uh, rather than just uh, the manipulate uh, the public opinion and uh, et cetera. So this is the way uh, indirectly answer your excellent question. I think I'm fully aware about the, the toxic nature, the anxiety, the tensions, but I still, uh, part of me still hope this will be temporary. Although how long we take, I do not know because we share same uh, uh, threat China should not be an enemy. Our enemy at the moment is COVID, is climate change, is nuclear uh, uh, proliferation. These are far more imminent challenge. Now, of course, if you continue to treat China as enemy, sooner or later, China will become an enemy. Is that the uh, fixed things like some of the scholars argue or is still could be changed? I certainly belong to the, uh, the school think it's nothing is predetermined. I do not have a fatalistic view, despite my worry and the concern. 